Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn, and this is Traditional Woodworking by Hand. And in today's episode, we're going to be going over some of the fundamentals of sawing. Now, I know we've talked about some of these things before, but we're about to start getting into more complicated sawing techniques and more complicated joints and doing a whole bunch of things that will require uh, a little more basic information. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to review some of the things that we've already talked about with saws and introduce some new things. Okay, so the first thing, and we're talking today primarily about hand saws and the, those are the saws that just have one blade, no back. They can be various lengths. And these are the saws that you use primarily to saw wood to length and to saw wood to width. You can buy hand saws today, brand new, and they can cost hundreds of dollars. But there's lots of them still available if you've got a yard sales and flea markets and junk stores and eBay, but it will help if you know what to look for to be able to tell whether you've got a good one or a bad one or one that's worth spending some time on reconstituting. One of the first tips is that no matter the condition of the blade, no matter how many paint spatters or how rusty it is or whatever, the first thing is to find a blade that doesn't have any dents on it and no kinks. Now, if you're a skilled metal worker, it's possible to take that out, but I'm a woodworker. So I would prefer to start off with a saw, no matter what the condition of it was, that is at least perfectly flat. The next thing that I look for is a saw that has a really nice proper handle. This is saw is probably a hundred years old, and you might think that it's particularly ornate, unnecessarily so, but that's not true. There's two things to notice here. First of all, any saw that has at least four, sometimes more, bolts that hold the handle onto the blade is generally better than a saw you might find that only has two or even three, and especially if it's wood. Look at the handle. The handle looks like it's a lot of arbitrary shapes, but there's a very good reason for this shape. The first of all is the fact that good handles have horns like this that anchor your hand really nicely into the blade. The second thing to know is that the handles are really all designed only for three fingers and the leading finger is supposed to be pointed forward. That way you have a really nice grip of the saw and furthermore you'll notice that the saw handle is at a bit of an angle. That's because when you saw backwards and forwards like this you're actually doing two things. You're sawing forward and you're also sawing downwards. And by tilting the handle, you equalize the pressure that you're using with your arm. Your arm is not a piston that just goes backwards and forwards, it kind of rotates. So those are just a couple of things to look for. All these other little things here are designed to make the saw handle as light as possible. They provide places where you can hook on saw guards and things like that that I'll show you later. But those are two important things to look for if you're going to buy a second-hand saw. One of the first things to know about a saw is how coarse it is. And on good old saws, that is always stamped on the heel of the saw. You'll see a number if you look closely. And what that tells you is that there are six teeth per inch. If we measure it, we put that on number one, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a six TPI saw. 
this next saw, if you look at the number there, is much finer. It cuts finer work. It leaves a thinner kerf. That's 10 TPI. Here is yet another saw that has a different number, and that's 8 TPI. If you count the number of teeth in an inch there, you'll find there are 8. So those are two important things to know about second-hand saws. The next thing that we've spent a whole episode on, and we, we may recap in the future, is whether you're going to use the saw to cut with the grain or across the grain. But we're going to ignore that for the moment, but I want to talk about something else that's important. Because our arm is not a piston, for the saw to work efficiently, the teeth all need to be level, but over the length of the saw, they need to be slightly crowned, which means that if you put a straight edge on here, you'd see that the saw was just a little higher in the middle than it was at the side. Now, I'm going to use something called a saw vise. This might look very complicated, but you'd be surprised how many of these you can find. And even if you can't find one of these, you can do exactly the same thing by using two pieces of tapered wood. You put these two pieces of tapered wood in the vise and put the saw in between it. And because the wood is tapered, that will also hold the saw nice and firmly. So let's use the saw vise. Let me just clamp it in like this. And the first thing that we need to do is to establish that the teeth are not only all the same height in preparation for sharpening, but also that they're slightly crowned. Here is yet another somewhat antique tool that now fortunately some high-end manufacturers are remaking and it's called a saw jointer and it's nothing more than a little device that holds a flat file and it slides over the teeth like this and in preparation for sawing for uh, for sharpening i mean you have to make sure that all the teeth are the same height and the way you do that is by running the saw jointer along the entire length of the saw and i'm doing this very lightly but if we were really going to sharpen it we'd press a little until we see a little shiny spot left by the file on every single tooth that guarantees that now all the teeth even if some of them are now really blunt, are the same height. If you're not lucky enough to have one of these, don't despair. It's a very easy thing to take a file and a square piece of wood, cut a slot in it, and insert any convenient file that's the same size. And now you can do the same thing. You place this against the saw, and it holds it up. Actually, if I turn it around, you can see there's more wood here. That helps guarantee that I'm holding it vertically. I can do the same thing. So this can be used as a homemade jointer. After having filed the teeth, the next important thing is to set the teeth. And what that means is that if you look at any properly tuned up saw, you'll see that each alternate tooth is bent out slightly. And the reason for that is that by the teeth, virtue of the fact that the teeth are bent out, they cut a kerf, a slot in the wood, that is thicker, wider than the bulk of the saw itself. If it wasn't, then the heat generated by the sawing could very easily cause the moisture that's present in almost every piece of wood to make the wood expand and the saw would bind. So it's important to be able to make a kerf that is wider than the thickness of the blade. Some saw manufacturers, especially distant, developed ways of actually grinding the saw blade so that the saw blade got thinner to the bottom. But 
you don't need to worry about that if you set the saw properly. Now, originally, we used something called a saw rest. Now, this is a tool from the 1800s, and you can see it's got lots of slots in there that match the size of the different teeth that you might be uh, having on, on any particular saw. And all that you do to bend the teeth the way that I just described is to find the right slot and put it over the tooth and bend it. It's called a saw rest, spelled W-R-E-S-T. Rests the, bl the blade over. Nothing to do with, you know, taking a break. This, however, was a little inaccurate and required a certain amount of skill. So then we invented this. And this peculiar looking thing is also called a saw setter. And you'll notice of great particularness the fact that it has a differently faced anvil there. And each of these slopes is at a different angle and has a number on it that relates to the TPI number that we saw at the beginning of this episode. So it's simply a question of rotating this until you get the right number there. And then starting at one end, you place this over and you squeeze it just like a pair of pliers and it will automatically bend the tooth into the exactly the right angle. Then of course you miss the next tooth because that has to come this way and you go all the way down the saw squeezing alternate teeth. When you've done that, you turn around and now you squeeze the other teeth. That way you get a saw where all the teeth are like this, making a nice even curve. Now, sometimes you can do that to excess. And if a saw has too much set, it can be hard to use and it can leave a very rough cut. You could go back and reset this. You could, as I've seen other people do, take the saw out of the saw vise, put it on something flat or heavy, and with a hammer, you could gently tap every other little tooth down. But an easier way to do it is simply to take a sharpening stone, and here's a relatively coarse thousand grit water stone, and simply run the water stone down the side of the saw, and then run it down the other side of the saw, and what that does is to reduce the set and give you a finer operating saw. One last tip that I want to, want to include in this episode is how to saw exactly. We'll talk about sharpening later on. The first tip is that if you have to saw a mortise or you have to saw down the middle of a board is don't just saw looking at one line, but position the workpiece so that you can see two lines. That way you can guarantee you're going down vertically and you can guarantee that you're going across the board like that. All right? Now I'm looking at both of these. So if I do that, and I know that I'm true down here and I'm true down there. One other tip is to use a saw with a guide. If I wanted to saw just the top of this piece of wood off, there's no reason, might look a little crude, but why I couldn't screw or clamp a guide to it so that I could saw until the guide hit the wood. That would guarantee that I had sawed to the right depth. And the last tip that I want to show you is if you have to saw at an angle. If for example, as we're going to be doing soon, how to make sliding dovetails. Here's a piece of wood, and I've marked a line where I want to make the sloping cut that will receive the sliding dovetail. So all I did was to cut a piece of wood that's at the angle of the dovetail, and by holding that firmly or clamping it in, I can take my saw, in this case a back saw, and by keeping the saw close to that angle, I'm automatically guaranteed to saw the angle that I need 
for the sliding dovetail. So those were just a few tips on sawing. As I said before, we're going to be getting into greater detail as we go further on, but I thought that was a good start. So if you want to see more, don't forget, as I say all the time, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and I'm happy to answer your queries and come back and watch some more. So thanks for watching. Have a good day.